obviously we talk about the left on this podcast quite a lot and what they're up to and what their purported aims are and things like that. How ugly they are. <laughs> That's true. I mean, mm. undeniable. Mm. We don't need to really point that one out. It's just obvious. But just mean. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that too. Um, however, I thought as we've got two psychologists in the room, it'd be good to sort of have a deeper look at their actual motivations. Because of course, understanding their purported reasons for doing what they're doing, um, that's very, very different to why they actually might be doing it. You know, people aren't always honest. I, I don't think I need to tell that to people. Souls um, say rhetoric versus reality. Mm-hmm. And I actually think that there are lots of profound insights you can get from there, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the, the studies looking at why they behave as they do, rather than, you know, trying to understand the minds of people that um, quite often are not the sanest, let's be honest. So um, before I actually get into that, though, it is worth mentioning we um, are looking for, um, oh, Aiden Paladin, we found yes. her. There she is. Oh my um, God. <laughs> No, we are looking Search over. looking for um, a production manager, and I have been given a sentence to read. Um, we are looking for people with skills in videography, audio, and editing available to work in the London or, or Swindon area. If you are interested um, in the full job spec, it is available at lotuseaters.com slash careers um, or lotuseaters.com slash career production manager with hyphens between career production and manager, which is, you know, you can see it on screen. You can read, can't you? If you can read... Look at this. Um, Smooth. Despite looking like a used car salesman, the <laughs> skills aren't quite up to snuff. <laughs> well, I sell new cars these days. So. Oh, right. Anyway, on to some of the studies. So this was recently picked up um, a couple of days ago. This is a study that I think came out of uh, Mormon University in Utah. Mm -hmm. um, I can't... BYU. BYU, that's the one. Mm -hmm. I, I can never remember all the acronyms yeah. and things like that. <laughs> but... Um, Apparently, liberals are three times more biased when cons uh, than conservatives when evaluating ideologically opposite individuals. And um, this is obviously something that I think lots of people have identified without research. But the research is interesting because, of course, being able to quantify it and understand the scale of the problem is very important because quite often I see people saying, well, why do I need a study to vindicate what I already know? Well, actually, yeah. scaling is very important in, in understanding the nature of the issue. You know, it could be 10 times, it could be two times. It makes a big difference. Sure, and it helps to just have any evidence for it in general. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, I mean, sure, some things are known just because you can observe them, but you need to be able to quantify them so that you can show other people, and particularly when the party of science, the left, says that they want evidence for everything, uh, that's the case until they don't like the actual evidence. It seems, or at least that's been my experience, as they seem to be a little bit mm. upset about this first one. Yes, and we are going to be looking at some of the reactions, which just prove the actual study, which is yeah. funny. And they even acknowledge, well, I know it kind of proves what they're saying, but still I'm angry, which is hilarious. So this was actually published in the Journal of Social Psychology, which, um, you know, um, despite having some rep replicability problems, um, is still a relatively prestigious yes. psychological journal. I'm slurring my words. I've not even had a drink today. <laughs> um, and um, I'm going to read a little bit from this. And it says, The researchers conducted a study in which they explored how political memes published on social media affect a perceiver's impression of the person who shared them. They also wanted to de determine um, the degree to which the person viewing the memes um, would indirectly um, aggress against the person who posted them based on assumptions about the political views of that person. And... Um, it says, the conservative and liberal memes and texts were crafted to be as similar as possible, reflecting the opposite political views. For example, I'm just going to say it, I hate Trump with an angry face emoji, which is not a meme, to be honest. I mean, that's, that's just a statement. Um, I'm just going to say it, I love Trump with a happy face emoji. Um, this understanding of memes makes me cringe <laughs> that a little bit. like such a Facebook boomer it, meme. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But it also kind of makes it a little bit believable in my mind that it's sort of a little bit out of touch and boomery. Yeah. You can kind of believe it. When it, com when it comes to the meme talk, I think it's interesting to point out uh, another aspect of the left-right's meme game, which is that I, one that I've seen pointed out quite often, which is if you ever see a stone toss meme, for instance, oftentimes the people that he is making fun of in the memes are not necessarily the target of the meme. It's the idea that they represent that is the target of, of the meme. Whereas when you see leftist memes, say for instance, when Kathy Griffin 
did that photograph of her holding the severed Trump head, which still gets shared about every so often. Uh, it's more about pointing at your ideological opposites and saying, you are evil, you are hideous, uh, you are awful, and you deserve to die. And I think that this difference exists because the right tends to understand the left better than the left oh, understands yes. the right. Mm. And this yeah. is not something that I'm sort of saying baselessly. It seems to be the case that yep. that's backed up in the literature to quite a significant degree, actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, lots of people on the right I know of have read lots of leftist literature. That right. The, the same can't be said on the opposite side. Oh, and that makes sense then why their memes are this person's evil, they're terrible, because that's all they can come up with are essentially just insults because they don't mm -hmm. have any, they don't understand what anyone on the right believes. So they don't have anything to make a meme out of. Mm. There's, an, there's another interesting thing there, which is even those on the left that purport to have read right-wing literature often demonstrate in practice that they have a very, very thin and, um, a, a, and rubbish understanding of it. Uh, there was a guy called Matt McManus, who's a professor who's done a number of debates with the distributist, if you're aware oh. of uh, what that was going on now. This guy pros professes himself to be an expert on right-wing literature. And then a few weeks ago, he made a post on Twitter that was absolutely absurd for anybody who claims to understand the history of right-wing thought and the development of right-wing ideologies is that he posted some excerpt from a book and he went, this is completely insane. I can't believe this. I'm only just learning this now. And it was an excerpt from a book showing that explaining that fascism had arisen as a response to communism mm -hmm. and that, uh, for instance, Germans in the 1930s saw communists as their greatest enemies, not just Jews. And I thought to myself, what have you missed? You're supposed to be an expert on this stuff. Whether you want to align fascism or national socialism with the right or left, most on the left, to put it on the right, how did you not already know this? You have got such a poor understanding of this if you're only just learning this incredibly basic fact. I mean, that's a record score for Godwin's Law as well, isn't right, it? Right, right. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I very much agree with what you're saying. And um, so obviously they showed them these memes and then um, according to the article talking about it because the, the paper isn't necessarily publicly available yet. Um, participants read a cover story presenting the study um, authors as industrial slash organizational psychologists developing a mach machine learning algorithm. So they basically deceived them because mm -hmm. they believed that um, if the participants knew why they were in the experiment, they would change their behavior, which is a very true yes. thing. And one of the main problems with the lab experiments in psychology is that people are aware when they're being observed and they can infer what you're meant to be um, doing almost they almost never guess the cover story though like because mm -hmm. that's very typical to almost always have a cover story and a lot of times in order to make sure you'll actually ask them if they guess what it was afterwards so you can use it as a measure to throw out those data if someone does guess what you're actually trying to study mm -hmm. funny thing is that a lot of universities mm -hmm. recruit um, psychology students as part of their, yeah. their scheme and I, I remember participating in them for credits mm -hmm. for my own studies and being able to guess um, what the study was actually about quite a lot of the time and yeah. Uh, it led to a lot of disappointed research. Yeah. It's basically just a waste of time for everyone yeah. at that point. But my gripes about the way university works aside. Um, and so the, the sort of overall conclusion was that liberals and conservatives tended to evaluate ideologically opposite individuals more negatively. Surprise, surprise. Um, however, this bias was three times stronger among liberals compared to conservatives. So I think we can all agree that, you know, observation and research seems to ma match up here quite clearly. But what is to be done about this? And, uh, you know, you could take the annoying sort of centrist trigonometry line of, well, we've <laughs> got to come together. Um, I, I reject that entirely and we, say, well... We have well, to come together with people who view us as an existential threat and want us dead. Yeah. Not I, sure how. <laughs> yeah, my, my perspective is that, well, conservatives are tending to be almost too even-handed to these people, mm. that if they're willing to go to great lengths to discriminate against you, well, surely that should get the same in return. And this was discrimination. It's mm -hmm. what they were looking at in the study specifically was, if you, would you hire this person for a job? Mm -hmm. um, so, or potentially that's part of it. So yeah, that is active, active discrimination against someone three times stronger for people on the left than it is on the right. And I don't know how you come to the table with someone who would, would want you to not have a job just because they uh, disagree politically. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's part of the reason that... Um, a lot of institutions have shifted leftwards is mm -hmm. that they're far more willing to gatekeep them. Yeah. And th this seems to be the case, right? That leftists are far more likely to push people out of institutions because 
they are three times more likely to discriminate against them. And so, well, that, what that says to the right is, well, you, you shouldn't be as tolerant to the left because they're not showing you the same tolerance. And that's how it should work, really. And um, here's the actual study itself. To meme or not to meme, political social media posts and ideologically motivated aggression in job recommendations. So if you wanted to look at it, you know, straight from the source, there it is. Um, but what I wanted to do, and I'm very sorry for subjecting you all to this, is look at uh, a, a reaction from a, a liberal hub that is Reddit. And I, I, I try to avoid this sort of thing, particularly the psychology thread, because here someone posted it. And uh, you, as you can this, guess... This, I'm sorry, this header image gets me every time. What do you think the directions were for the photographer for this model? I mean, good God. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, carry on. I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Like, uh, imagine, <laughs> imagine um, you know, working for a stock photo company and this is how you're, you're sort of represented in this article thumbnail. <laughs> Terrible. Anyway, so the top comment <laughs> is... Uh, perfect vindication of this. I mean, I'm not going to trust the Mormons on this. Their entire worldview is skewed. And it says... Right yeah. over his head. And then they also said, edit, for those uh, peeing your pants with angry glee, y'all didn't even bother to open the damn journal until I triggered your feelings. Oh. Mormons are not grounded in reality and their scientific article should be taken with a grain of secret gold plates in a hole under a hat that only one person can see. So that is a person absolutely seething and then the person replying to them there, I, I just noticed that the study was done at BYU. Now I'm trying to figure out if I'm literally proving their point by being a liberal who is having an instant knee-jerk reaction against my stereotype of Mormon institutions. That person's a sort of evolution in mm. consciousness from that initial poster there. But there are people who... Um, oh, my mouse is not working. Uh-oh. Never mind. Oh, wait, there you go. Here we go. Oh. Slight delay. Oh. It, it, it's not working. Never mind. I can, I can adapt. And there's, there's a comment around here somewhere. Um, where is it? Basically, someone just saying, yeah, that checks out. Fair enough. Um, I, I can't find it anymore. Um, there's another person criticizing the methods. They, they're basically it's funny pointing out. funny how they get access to it. Mm -hmm. Unless you have access to the journal right now, which it might be published. I think it has published, but did they pay a lot of money for it? I am, I'm curious. Did they actually read it? Because, of course, that one person is like, oh, you didn't even read it yet. Did you, though? Because hmm, I wouldn't have said that I if I had read it. I think it's easy to see what's going on yeah. here, which is I'm in this picture and I don't like it. Yes. Yes. And um, the, the comment I was trying to find basically mm -hmm. said um, when the study agrees with what they believe, mm -hmm. it, it's, yeah. it's, you know, good methodology. It's all fine. Right. When it, it disagrees with them, the methodology is bad. And, you know, I've seen studies that agree with me and I've spotted that the methodology oh, yeah. is bad. Yep. That's part of being a good researcher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's something you should pride yourself on, not necessarily just being completely partisan. You, you've got to sort of read between the lines and look for good evidence. So there, is, there are also histories of, of people being biased towards other people as well. Um, here's a study being talked about at the University of Exeter actually recently uh, disciplined someone for saying they didn't agree with veganism in their own room. Um, so a lovely institution. Um, but supposedly, Twitter users three times more likely to follow back the accounts of strangers if they share the same political views. Interesting that it's three times as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That number just keeps on coming up. So um, it seems to be a phenomenon. They're also um, more likely to block others because of politics. Um, here we have a consistently liberal, significantly more likely than, say, mostly conservative or consistently conservative to block people. Um, they're more likely to drop people from being their friend. Look at consistently liberal. That's massive compared to other people. And the reason that you know that they're succeeding is because they are gatekeeping to a significant degree. And the right isn't doing this nearly enough. And that's why I think quite often things are going wrong. Mm. I don't know whether you guys agree. I've already done a video speaking about this in the past. Uh, the left gates keep gatekeeps to the right, mm -hmm. and the center right gatekeeps to the right as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the center right often acts as a mechanism by which it is trying to hold the left to its own principles, and then so therefore ends up embodying those principles in a more honest way, because the left are all rhetoric. Mm -hmm. I was discussing this with um, a friend, Spoon, uh, the other day, 
and we were discussing this and saying how the 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 two sides often operate opposite to one another in terms of the rhetoric where the left is all about equal rights and democracy in their rhetoric where the way they actually operate is incredibly rigidly hierarchical and deferential to power and elitist the right op uh, operates the exact opposite way their rhetoric is elitist it's all about hierarchy whereas in reality the principles they try to uphold themselves to are democratic and equal rights based and so you end up with the right just oftentimes capitulating to the left at least the, the center right as it's existed uh the 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 william f buckley jr right you could say good example yeah it's, and it's it's moral foundations theory that people who lean to the left only tend to have two uh, values which is avoiding harm and caring for others or at least wanting to be seen as if they care for others, which I think we'll talk about later, and a um, issue with um, fairness. or But again, that's perceived fairness not or perceived justice, not actual justice, whereas conservatives tend to value all of the morals. So also purity and authority and loyalty. Um, and then liberty only applies to libertarians <laughs> who are very strong liberty and nothing else in terms of moral values. <laughs> but uh, yeah, when you only have two out of six values that you care about, it absolutely shows up like that. Um, becomes evident that these are the things they care about more than anything being seen as caring about. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, having an effect on society, and people are aware of this going on. Uh, and it says staunch liberals stand out as only group who feels they can share their political opinions. And that's because they've captured institutions because of this approach to politics. Um, that's amazing that they can answer in that way and still pretend like they're the ones out of power. There we go. Um, you can see it a bit better there. So strong conservative, only 23%, um, you know, disagree that they're being silenced which is quite a lot compared to the the inverse of that right but anyway um it's also worth mentioning that they are completely insane um <laughs> has a doctor or healthcare provider ever told you that you have a mental health condition percentage saying yes and this is an utter condemnation of liberal women right there mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that is leagues above everyone else i mean the liberal men are significantly higher as well but conservative men and women seem to be um, far more healthy. And I think the, the, the key to this, I don't know. Um, There's a confound here. Okay. You, can you, uh, the, so the confound is that leftists tend to have and liberals tend to have a more positive sort of um, perception of mental health. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be more likely to see, uh, seek out a therapist. So are they really that crazier? I would agree, yes. But uh, <laughs> there, there is a confounding variable there, which is that they may be more likely to ask someone to diagnose them with depression or some other mental health condition. Mm -hmm. Just a caveat. Uh, yeah. They, that, given that I would argue that liberals are those who have completely and totally swallowed the propaganda that we've been fed for a long time. Part of that propaganda comes from the therapeutic st uh, state. You constantly see therapize, uh, uh, th um, therapizing, pathologizing. And one of the ways that people are pathologized is if you behave in a certain way, then you're a fascist. I think these people are absolutely desperate to prove they're not a fascist. And so they will go to these therapists who are constantly being told uh, that y you're much better. You'll have a much better life if you go to therapy constantly. Even on YouTube adverts, you get um, better help is one that I get constantly because you're always being pushed towards it. I don't necessarily think that fascism's too much to do with it but i do think that the focus on family and you know focusing on your profession the sort of more traditional lifestyle of the conservative tends to lead to um a lifestyle which seems more uh, in keeping with human psychology if if you know what i mean mm -hmm. Um, I, I do I, also think there is the dysgenic element, which is that <laughs> the, these people are automatically yeah. going to be more attracted to these insane ideologies. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're also more likely to be dissatisfied um, with their mental health as well. So this is their own self-report on their own mental well-being. And uh, liberal women, again, uh, leading the pack with dissatisfaction by a reasonable amount. Um, liberal men also beating uh, everyone there. It's also worth noting as well, uh, conservative women tend to do pretty well there, more so than everyone else. So uh, yeah, that's that's interesting, isn't it? Because of course, the sort of common wisdom is that women tend to suffer more with mental health issues than men do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's clearly not necessarily true, depending on what you believe. Yeah. And it, it does, again, bring up the order, um, chicken or the egg, is that yeah. are, are they in crazier to begin with and that's what draws them towards these politics or does the politics drive them to be unhappy mm -hmm. and well, i don't know which one's accurate maybe a bit of both mm -hmm. well i think that your personality is dictated mm -hmm. 
your your personality is dictated by your your genes to a certain extent, a reasonable extent actually, and your personality dictates your politics to a large extent. So it, it seems to be that there's this thread going through things mm -hmm. here, um, whereby the certain neuroses may well be you know genetically inherited. Um, so here's another one. Uh, they're just generally less happy with life. Um, this is completely satisfied with your life by sex and ideology. This was a 2022 uh, poll of American families done by the UK government for some reason. I don't know why our tax money is finding this out, but it's useful at least. And uh, yes, it's almost like two to one, certainly for um, liberal women compared to conservative women, they're much happier. And there's got to be something to it, right? Either they're Either the conservatives are lying about their own happiness, you know, sort of faking it until they make it, or maybe there actually is a trend. And I think that possible, but it is. would be odd for it to be that consistent. Yes. So potentially, but no, unlikely. I, 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 I do agree with that. I, I think that most of the time when people are talking about this sort of thing, they tend to be quite honest mm -hmm. because depressed people tend to be relatively happy when filling out these surveys mm -hmm. from my sort of knowledge of the research. In yeah. reporting how they actually feel, it's sort of a almost a form of catharsis is the way they yeah. perceive the filling out the forms. So it makes sense. And the individuation effects, which is an, uh, being anonymous, people mm -hmm. will tell you pretty much anything as long yeah. as you tell them that they're anonymous. They'll say mm -hmm. sure and open up uh, about some really heavy mm -hmm. stuff in surveys. <laughs> yeah, it's it's strange how people really police themselves mm -hmm. with social repercussions, isn't it? So on to things to do with personality. And um, this was just asking um, in a survey a bunch of left-wing authoritarians, I presume. And I'm just going to read the part from the results here. It says, the results of multiple regression analysis showed that a strong ideological view according to which a violent revolution against existing social structures is legitimate, for example, anti-hierarchical aggression, was associated with antagonistic narcissism, demonstrated in the first study, and psychopathy in the second study. However, neither... Um, dispositional altruism nor social justice commitment was related to left-wing anti-hierarchical aggression. So basically, narcissism and psychopathy di dictate how much you want to be a, a left-wing revolutionary more than their actual um, care for other people or their commitment to so-called social justice, which is quite a condemnation. So their purported reason for doing it isn't even as strong as their own self-interest, clearly. Yeah, it's actually interesting that there, I'm glad to see that there's a new study with left-wing authoritarianism. If you don't know, this instrument's very new. Mm -hmm. um, it's, for years, uh, goes back to Altmaier, like in the 60s, and that uh, developing the right-wing authoritarianism instrument. Mm -hmm. And that's been used for forever. It used to be we've, called- We've covered this before. It we? used to be called yeah. the F scale, standing yes. for fascism that, that, that scale. Was, that was the uh, Frankfurt School yes. that developed yes, that it was, in yeah. California in the 50s, yeah. Yes, which it came from the Frankfurt School, and then Altmaier read jigged it into being the right-wing authoritarianism instrument, which they use all the time. And it wasn't until about three years ago that they started, that they even developed this left-wing authoritarianism instrument because the social scientists for decades kept repeating, there is no such thing as left-wing authoritarianism, so let's not bother to develop an instrument to measure it. Joseph and Stalin, <laughs> right-winger. The, right. the funny thing is, if you look at the studies that were done on the um, authoritarian personality mm -hmm. stu uh, studies, now I, I've, I've read a um, text that goes over a lot of the studies that uh, the Frankfurt School, uh, I think it was mainly Adorno, mm -hmm. uh, included in the authoritarian personality. And the guy I read goes through a lot of the responses and finds that what he was, what they were doing was they were getting these people to answer questions about their personal lives and their relationships to their own parents, how they felt about their parents, how they felt about themselves. And basically, the more stable and normal, yep. you seemed, they would label these people as being repressed <laughs> and uh, subject to authoritarianism. And the more unstable people were, the more dissatisfied they were in life, the more they had familial issues with their parents, or maybe they just had absentee parents in the first place, they would label these people as having some form of uh, unrestrained liberty that was good for them. So I, I kind of characterize it like this, if you're going to go with the whole authoritarian um, uh, scale if you want to go left and right. So right-wing authoritarianism is as you as the individual want to learn piano. Me? So so, so the right-wing authoritarian... Piano, it, well, d d d imagine <laughs> for a moment there. Open up your imagination. 
So, so the right wing authoritarianism say, okay, I'll let you play piano, but I'll hold you to strict rules and make sure that you apply yourself to your fullest so that you can learn to play piano. Left wing authoritarianism is you go, dad, dad, I want to play guitar. And he goes, no, you're playing piano and every wrong note that you get, I'm going to break your finger. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good way of characterizing yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> You wouldn't be able to play piano for particularly long after that, would no. you? Well, no, but that's the counterproductiveness of uh, communism, isn't it? Re really, we're going to build a worker society where if the workers don't do what we want, we'll send them to the gulags. Hmm. So this next study is one of my favourites, and I've mentioned it quite a lot um, over the years. And this is um, signalling virtuous victimhood as indicators of dark triad personality. So they were looking at... Um, consequences and predictors of emitting the signal of um, victimhood and virtue and virtue signaling of course virtue signaling it's like um, saying oh i'm you know i can't get a job because i'm black in america and things like that that's you know i've done nothing it's wrong not, it's, it's not the, my criminal record i swear the fact i was stealing his phone in the job interview you know, <laughs> had nothing to do with it um so there's a series of six studies which they went through and sort of tested um, their conclusions of each study. And I really like studies like this. Oh, it's and this one's yeah, this is huge. Uh, and they're really creative studies too. So mm. if you do have time to read through it and care about stuff like this, this is a really fascinating uh, piece. I covered it extensively on a video I did about virtuous victimhood um, about a year ago. So yeah, I, I absolutely love this one. So uh, do do humor me for going yeah. over it. But oh, um, yeah. So it's a, it basically operates under the theory that modern victim signaling is about non-reciprocal resource extraction from institutions or individuals more resource rich than themselves. And I believe that this is the animating principle that um, governs a lot of politics more generally. I, I believe that um, particularly elites, um, as well as lots of other people as well, engage in politics to extract resources from other people um, as a strategy of acquiring resources themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that a very large amount of politics basically comes down to this fundamental truth that politics is resource extraction. I know this makes me sound uh, sort of autistically libertarian, um, and I, I will, will talk about taxation eventually, but um, <laughs> it's, it basically amounts to um, material things like money, jobs, and access to education, as well as symbolic things such as respect, tolerance, and compassion. These are all words as well that have been co-opted by the left. Almost saying them makes my skin crawl these days. But basically, they showed that individuals with dark triad traits um, more frequently signaled their virtuous victimhood in the Western world. And that the dark triad, um, if you're not familiar, is narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. And these are characterized by um, narcissism, grandiosity, pride, egoism, lack of empathy, Machiavellianism, which is doing Machiavelli dirty, really, but still is manipulation and exploitation of others, an absence of morality, unemotional callousness, and a higher level of self-interest. And psychopathy, I think everyone knows. Um, but yes, it's just being selfish, impulsive, and um, being remorseless and brutal. And um, it will say, um, some people will repeatedly emit this signal in an opportunistic manner to initiate non-reciprocal resource transfer. It says, our first three studies demonstrated how a perceived victim signal can lead others to transfer resources to a victim, but that the motivation to do so is amplified when the victim signal is paired with a virtue signal. Um, and those with the dark triad traits signal more often. And... Um, in this, this third study of theirs, of the six, they showed that these virtuous victim signalers were more willing to purchase counterfeit products and judge counterfeiters as less immoral compared to less frequent signalers. And that was a pattern which was also observed when using participants' dark triad scores instead of how much they signalled, just in case that signalling score wasn't as good um, a sort of proxy um, for that metric. And also, um, they were also more likely to lie and cheat and steal Mm -hmm. um, for extra monetary rewards mm -hmm. in a coin flip game. Yep. Uh, so yes, these these virtuous victims are not so virtuous after all. And also, communal narcissism was a significant um, predictor of the frequency of it. And that's basically narcissism, but for a, a sort of identified group. Mm -hmm. So it can be a sort of a collectivist impulse, which is right. interesting. And another thing too about the narcissism in general is that there are two types of narcissism. I think in this one they did collapse it to just a generalized narcissism instrument. Mm -hmm.
But there is grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism. And in some of the research that I've looked at, it seems because when you hear the word narcissism, you think usually someone who is ostentatious, outgoing, very full of themselves. That's grandiose narcissism. But um, uh, vulnerable narcissism is oftentimes people have very low self-esteem or they they get depressed and they want other people to, or they act depressed because they want people to give them attention. Um, grandiose narcissists already like themselves, so they provide their own attention. Um, then the vulnerable narcissist doesn't get attention or doesn't get what they want. Uh, they become very upset. And I think that, and from the research I've seen, the left tends to have a real big problem with vulnerable narcissism, not with grandiose narcissism. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you think of Andrew Tate, there's a narcissist, but that's that vulnerable narcissism, the mm -hmm. I need attention, I need people to care for me. That's vulnerable narcissism. That would explain the prevalence of the cry bully yes, archetype exactly. on the left. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yes. So um, the, what they basically conclude is that a lot of the people that are emitting these signals are sort of aware of what they're doing as well, which mm -hmm. is interesting. And it sort of makes it all the more insidious. If it were sort of unconscious and they weren't really aware that they were doing it in this way, it would make it at least a little bit more excusable, perhaps. But sort of the part of this, this study, because I had this up here, too. Um, I don't remember from which one of the, the experiments and it was, is that they were more prone towards fantasy thinking mm -hmm. and towards um, exaggeration of what had happened in the past. So I think it's it's more that they gaslight themselves into thinking things are different from how they actually are because they invent fantasies and exaggerate until they believe their own lies. I mean, at least that's from some of the research in this set. I can certainly see that happening mm -hmm. because oh yeah <laughs> a, a lot of the time uh, when you argue with left wingers which i've ha unfortunately done a fair amount of they straw man you constantly and you'd be like hang on this is what i believe at least argue against that and then they'll take the most uncharitable interpretation it's like well you're not interfacing with mm -hmm. reality anymore are you because that's what they heard mm -hmm. they engaged in fantasy thinking and exaggeration and just heard whatever they mm -hmm. wanted you to what they wanted to hear so, Whereas um, w when I approach arguing with someone, I try and look at, uh, particularly when it's written, the words they've said and argue the point rather than the idea or putting like an idea in their mind or saying, oh, you really mean this. Yeah, but then you can't engage in solipsism. So yeah, <laughs> that's well, no fun. Not as fun. <laughs> and um, here's one that you actually drew my attention to. Oh, yeah. And um, this one was kind of a bit harrowing as well. It's titled... Um, where is it? It's got a different title there. Um, there's two from this. There's two titles. No, but no, there's two from this research cohort that I talked about that are in the, published in the same year. Mm -hmm. um, but um, this one is, is titled Each um, is to Count for One and One for More Than One, <laughs> which is a very confusing title, actually. Predictors of Support for Economic Redistribution, which is a very bland title for a very interesting study. And I wanted to draw attention to um, this table here because these are predict predictors of support for coercive redistribution. And so coercive redistribution is taking people's resources um, via the state, one would presume, but not mm -hmm. necessarily, and then redistributing them among probably like-minded individuals. And um, the effect size here is the most interesting thing to me, um, because the, the ones that are actually significant here, um, malicious envy, self-interest, uh, at to a certain extent, communal fairness, although it doesn't, it has the lowest effect size and instrumental harm. Um, obviously, malicious envy, we kind of know what that is. They're envious of people with more resources than them. Self interest, again, is pretty self evident. Um, the communal fairness, again, you can say, well, that there is some sort of, they perceive it via the, the nexus of this fairness imbalance, even though there mm -hmm. may be perfectly legitimate reasons why someone has more resources than them. And the instrumental harm was the interesting one um, because it's kind of a nebulous term, but what it actually means is it gives a, a moral agent permission to instrumentally use and severely harm or even kill innocent people to promote the greater good, um, which is you know very hot fuzz of them. And uh, that's the concerning one. Yeah. And that one's the second most significant mm -hmm. effect size of them all. So to clarify, that's people who essentially already want to hurt other people and are simply looking for a virtuous excuse to do so. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, and the coercive redistribution is it was up to it, including killing or, or torturing or seriously harming other people to redistribute. Mm -hmm. um, in this, I mean, that in every experiment, because there were a couple of them, this one too, if I remember correctly, but this one I haven't read as, uh, recently. And I think the thing with fairness too is that it's the way that the instrument is loaded, it probably is perceived fairness of wanting to be seen as fair, 
So you would answer questions on that questionnaire being like, yes, I'm a very fair person because that's the one, one of the two morals that really matters to leftists. So it makes total sense to me as to why fairness is significant as well as, yeah, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to torture you. Like, I, they, it actually does align um, with their uh, psycho psychological profile. And of course, we've seen this manifest. I think that the, the Soviet Union was a legitimate manifestation of, of left-wing ideology. Uh, I know there are some people that argue about that, but it's nonsense. Of course it was. Um, you don't get collective farms unless you believe in collectivism, do you? And uh, yeah, well, we, we saw torture and murder on a mass scale in the name of fairness. Really inventive and horrible, harrowing ways of torturing people as well. If you only read the first few chapters of the Gulag Archipelago. That's one of the only books in my life I couldn't actually finish well, yeah, because it was so harrowing. Solzhenitsyn just discussing the really mundane ways that you could torture somebody into granting a confession. Just sitting someone in a chair that's a little bit too high for your feet to be able to touch the, touch the floor so your feet go numb and having them sat there for hours and hours and hours on end without being allowed to get up or sleep. The one that got to me was making a really old man stand in a corner for three days straight, um, and as soon as he sort of fell over or sat down, they would shoot him. Mm. It's, just, it's just pure evil. There's no reason, ideological or otherwise, to do that to another human being. But uh, I suppose that's why I'm not a leftist. But um, on the topic of leftist ideology, um, one of them is the LGBT movement, and um, the cer certainly the ideological component of it anyway. And of course, this is uh, skyrocketing at the minute because of course it's not biological, it's a sort of social contagion more than anything. And um, yes, nearly four in 10 young liberal women identify as LGBT. And I find this interesting because there has been um, research into sort of personality of, of people like this. And I, I like this one just because of the title, mainly. Um, the Dark Side of the Rainbow. Homosexuals and bisexuals have dar darker, um, darker, higher dark triad traits than heterosexuals. And um, it, it reads that um, bisexuals and homosexuals were more Machiavellian than heterosexuals, and bisexuals were more psychopathic and narcissistic than heterosexuals. The only significant finding in within sex comparisons showed that self identified bisexual women score higher on all dark triad traits than heterosexual women, which is interesting, isn't it? Well, is not part of that likely because of the identification part, because it's in vogue to do so. Mm -hmm. So, in particular, it makes sense then why, and I Found a lot of women identify as bisexual because it's non-committal, so you get to be in the uh, LGBT umbrella, but you don't have to actually do anything. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as being, um, in that sense, as being a, what do they call it, a non-binary, where you can just mm -hmm. just keep, go about doing everything you were doing before, but now they have to call you by Zimzer or something. Yeah, it's, uh, it's more of an ideological and social status yes. signifier mm -hmm. than an actual lifestyle that these people are adhering to. One could say a virtue signal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and hence the dark triad relationship there then. Yeah, and I think that there are obviously people um, who probably are there for genuine reasons. Um, sure. Uh, I'm not necessarily dismissing that. I, I don't think that, you know, all homosexuals are psychopaths, for example. So if you're watching Hope Not Hate, um, please, I do want a bank account. Um, <laughs> but if you feel like maliciously editing and clipping this, then, you know, yeah, go we right can't ahead, really stop yeah. you. And uh, just to add fuel to the fire, I wanted to end on something that is a little bit controversial, although it's not framed like this. This is uh, in, on nature.com, so, you know, the premier journal in science. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit about this. So it, basically, it's facial recognition technology that can detect facial, um, um, facial orientation, political orientation um, from just regular pictures of people. And... Um, it looked at over a million individuals and it correctly guessed the political orientation in 72% of cases, whether they were liberal or conservative. Uh, and obviously, the by chance, uh, one is 50% and the human accuracy is 55%. So this is absolutely massive. Um, even when you give someone a personality questionnaire, you can only guess their political orientation 66% of the time. So the fact that technology can do this is interesting for multiple reasons. One is the sort of Skynet one, mm. where 
I am absolutely terrified that the state is going to use CCTV to track people of my political persuasion to do us in. Uh, and the second thing is that this is kind of a vindication of physiognomy, isn't it? That you can kind of tell what someone's politics are just by looking at them. And uh, <laughs> it's not exactly uh, politically correct, even amongst you know some some on the purported right um, to say these sorts of things. But I think that if genetics determine personality, which determines politics, then genetics also determine what you look like in a far more direct way. Because your physical appearance um, is affected by genes, which also affect personality, they're not necessarily independent of one another, that there is overlap there. It's not necessarily 100%. Mm -hmm. But there's a significant degree of overlap. That's why when you domesticate animals, their physical appearance changes, even though you're only selecting for tameness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's, there have been a couple of studies that have to do with um, the facial structure and, and political beliefs. So this wouldn't just come out of anywhere. Um, but it's interesting now that the AI is so accurate at it. And that is the terrifying part is that, oh, yeah, I could see some governments loving to use this mm -hmm. to uh, track people just based on, yeah. You've got a dissident face. You've got a dissident face. Yeah. I believe the facial recognition technology is something that's either already been implemented yeah. in Scotland or is being implemented up there and is beginning to be implemented here as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is some worrying implications. But on the actual science of the matter, I find it absurd that anybody would even deny uh, that the human brain, which is a pattern recognition machine developed over hundreds of thousands, if not longer, uh, years, um, wouldn't be able to recognize particular patterns about how people look and how people who look in a particular way behave. And there's a reason there's a Baz meme about British people. And uh, Bazes are known to behave in a particular way. And if you meet a Baz in public, yeah, he's probably going to act like you would expect the Baz to behave. Well, there's also a certain thing that the behavior dictates the appearance in that the doughy face comes from years of sinking lager, which I respect, by the way. That's not and, a, and, a slight. And darts as well, of course. <laughs> He's got the perfectly weighted arms <laughs> with this great big counterweight hanging off. Have you the seen that where road. darts players lose weight and stop being good at the game all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. And they put the weight back on and they're back to top four. <laughs> I like a sport where the unhealthier you are, the better you get. There needs to be something for people like me. <laughs> Maybe it is something to do with the balance of having a big wobbly belly. Yeah. <laughs> Keeps you grounded. It's like, it's like a counterweight, isn't it? But um, my point being in all of this, that there are lots of things that you wouldn't necessarily intuitively discovered looking at politics and sort of even trying to be quite analytical about it from research like this. And I think it's actually very valuable. And I mm -hmm. imagine that you yeah. feel much the same. Oh, yeah. I mean, academia is completely captured, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that sometimes in interesting information doesn't still get through it. Um, the people who are totally ideologically driven, they are going to do their best to try and, and suppress information like this. But it does happen because most scholars are not complete lunatics and just want to study their one weird thing that they're interested in. Um, when talking about a little bit about the uh, gender issues and um, with women or having more uh, what was it? Oh, more likely to be bisexual. There was that rapid onset gender rapid onset gender dysphoria study from 2012 that that has been more or less completely retracted. And the reason why was because they asked parents to identify or to say, "Hello, my child in the last six months has suddenly ident started identifying as transgender." And in that study, it was three or at least three, if not two, it was two to three or to one males uh, identify or excuse me, females identified as males rather than the vice versa. And what they found was if you had if one of these girls in high school um, had one friend who came out as trans, all of them did. That study was more or less the problem was because they was because they asked the parents to identify it, not they didn't ask the students to identify themselves. So the study was thrown out as bad methods. But I still think that there's value in that study. It just the left was unhappy with it. And all of a sudden they are not the party of the science. They're not the group of science when they doesn't align with the, their pet beliefs. However, most people just don't pay attention to this stuff, so it you mm -hmm. know, sneaks by. I mean, I was a great big nerd and did a master's in research methodology, so I love going through this sort of thing. Oh, yeah. My bread and butter. Yep, me too. <laughs> uh, sorry, I've insulted you by pro <laughs> no. association there. Yeah. Right? No, no, sorry. No. Absolute nerds. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that with all, with all due respect. <laughs> well, if I wasn't a nerd, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Neither would I, to be honest. Yeah, same. <laughs> Well, that's a weird way to end the segment, but there we go. Um, 
the left are weird, and that's why. Um, if you appreciated that episode from the podcast The Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium contents on the site, such as the Epoch series, this episode on Tiberius Gracchus. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.